Thanks, Rachel. Morning. Hey, how we doing? Great, 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 great. Brand new series we're starting today. Questions we don't ask into in, into church. In church. Uh, and to be fair, uh, that's kind of a misnomer. It's kind of a blanket statement. And many of us have actually, if we're honest, asked these questions out loud and in church. Um, but the reason we're calling this is because it's we kind of got the vibe that maybe you weren't supposed to ask these questions in church, right? Many of you faced when you asked these questions in church, left you thinking, maybe we, we shouldn't have asked that, right? Or maybe there was resistance to these questions, or maybe you were part of a community where asking a question like this felt like a betrayal, right? Or that you should have known the answer, or that you were given answers that were deeply unsatisfying, that maybe left you feeling like the thing that nobody was saying was, we wish you wouldn't ask these kind of questions and upset the apple cart. Or maybe like some of my friends, you were actually just told outright, hey, just don't ask those questions, okay? That just, that just makes it, you know, hard for everyone else who's just totally at peace, and those just kind of rock the boat. So don't do that, right? And so we just thought, this is really important. We should ask these questions. Um, and, you know, as we're kind of looking at these questions, and even this theme, we talked about this last week of skepticism in church, and sometimes that often feels like skepticism and doubt is the opposite of faith, or it's the enemy of faith. And I, whenever that comes up, I always think about doubting Thomas. Now, you don't have to be religious to hear that phrase, doubting Thomas, right? Like, that's just common vernacular in our world, right? We say, oh, there's such a doubting Thomas. And the interesting thing I always want to draw people back to is like, hey, just so you know, like, Thomas was a real guy. And he asked one question for the last 2,000 years. I mean, just imagine asking one question, and for the next 2,000 years, people remember you as doubting Mark, right? Like, Come on, poor guy, asked one question. And like, to be fair, it was a legit question. He watched Jesus crucified on a Roman cross, like killed by professional executioners. And then all of a sudden, apparently Jesus is standing in his midst. I'd have some questions too. And the poor guy for 2,000 years has been called Doubting Thomas, right? Jesus doesn't give him that name though. Jesus understands that's a fair question. So what does he do? He shows him his hands. And he says, just go ahead, put your hands in the nail scarred you know, holes in my hand. Like he's willing to deal with skepticism and doubt. He understands that that's just part of being human. And when religious people are fearful of doubt or skepticism. That's a religious people's problem. That's not a Jesus problem. Jesus welcomes questions. And all throughout the New Testament, we're encouraged to actually have a foundation for our faith and understand why we believe what we believe. And how do you understand what you believe? You ask good questions. And so we welcome those here. We love great questions uh, here at Lakeside. And so for at least the next two weeks, we're going to be unpacking some questions that we don't often ask in church. And I say at least only because I feel like it's this asterisk now I need to add whenever I start a series because I have this problem of sometimes starting a series and be like, it's two weeks, it's three weeks. And then I'll be like, sorry, I had more to say. It's four, five, six, seven weeks. So uh, depending on the questions and how the conversations go and the emails that you send, we might add some more weeks. But at the moment, there's the two biggest questions that we're going to tackle. And we're starting today with number one, why do innocent people suffer and why do bad things happen to good people? Why is that number one? Because that is the number one question statistically that people ask about faith. Right? And that's no mystery as to why that's the number one question. You turn on your TV, you scroll social media, you'll see floods, school shootings, sexual assaults, bullies, famines, wars, thousands of kids killed in airstrikes, terrorism, fanaticism, religious trauma, cults, children dying of sickness and diseases. We can all agree that there is so much suffering in the world. And at the same time, Christians are like, God is all powerful and God is all knowing and all seeing and perfectly loving. And if you sit with those two facts for any length of time, you might start to think, how do you guys square that circle, right? Like you just look at the equation and you think perfectly loving, all powerful God, horrible evil and suffering in the world. And you just like, if you're honest and that's not a bad question to ask, that's just an honest question. Like that doesn't seem to add up and I get it. So today, we're going to unpack this question with the time that it deserves, and I'm going to break the message for today down into two parts, okay? So first, we're going to look at the different views on suffering that often Christians take, and then part two, we're going to look at actual specific suffering, evil, natural disasters, and sickness and suffering, and we're going to systematically go through it. So we have lots, lots to cover today, um, and before we jump in, let me just give a few caveats, okay? So first off, this is an incredibly touchy subject. I realize for some of you, this is not a mental exercise. This is real life. You're not asking this question because of suffering that you saw on the news. You're asking this question because you're dealing with cancer in your family right now. You hear pain every night when the meds wear off. Or you're watching a child suffer debilitating illness and you can't imagine another day of it. 
Or you have family back home going through a horrible situation and you can't even get them on the phone. Or you're journeying with loved ones who've had to bury someone before their time and so much more. For so many of you, this is not just a mental exercise. So hear me first and foremost. Jesus' response when Jesus encountered suffering was not a sermon. Jesus had grief. He wept with the hurting. He sat with the suffering. And when we meet someone going through incredibly difficult times, we don't share a sermon on our thoughts from where pain comes from. We sit with them in their pain. We cry with them. We feed them. We serve them. But that also doesn't negate that we do at times need to discuss these things. And so today we are discussing it. So caveat number one is if you aren't in a place where you, you mentally are like, yeah, I can just wrestle with these concepts, um, that's no problem. If you're watching online or you're on the podcast later on, feel free to skip this message and come back to it another day. That's fine. Uh, if you're in the room, I won't be offended if you were like working on a grocery list. If you're just like, I'm not ready to engage fully, like totally, I get that, okay? Um, but today we are gonna wrestle mentally with these concepts. Uh, and I'm just aware that some of those mental gymnastics might be too much emotionally for some of you. That's one. Uh, number two, entire books and doctoral dissertations have been done on this topic. We won't even, we won't exhaust any, anything, not even close. My goal today is to show you that Christians can ask these questions and to model there are answers to these questions. So think of today simply like an ad, a, appetizer, right? Like we're simply going to scratch the surface and you're welcome to dig deeper on these topics, okay? Um, so then on that one, third caveat is there's some great resources out there. I, I could send you more, but today I'll highlight one that I've just really enjoyed, and it's just really accessible, Wrestling with Doubt, Finding Faith by Adam Hamilton. Uh, I love this book, and I'm actually incredibly grateful to this book. It's kind of helped me with my outline uh, for this message and next week's message, so I always love to give credit where credit's due. And if you're like me and you like easy reads, this is just one step up from picture books, okay? So like... <laughs> All of us can access it, okay? Um, and then if you want something that's like really smart, email Robin, okay? Um, she'll, she, yeah, she's awesome. Uh, anyways, uh, and then fourth thing is at the end of the day, um, we're really comfortable with mystery here. Uh, I'm not up here because I have all the answers. Some of you are like clearly. Um, but as you'll see today, there's, there's many questions that even I have that I'm without answers to. So if you're expecting neat little bows at the end of today, you're probably going to be disappointed. Scripture speaks of mystery and that one day things will be totally clear that aren't clear now, and we're okay with that. We don't feel the need to put neat little bows on everything, but it doesn't mean that we don't still wrestle and ask questions. Um, and, and, and also just to say, uh, this is a heavy topic, and I'll try and make it a little fun for us too. So it's okay to laugh and enjoy the process as we kind of journey through this as a community, okay? So let's jump in. So first half, the different views on evil and suffering. Uh, so remember our equation, perfectly loving God and uh, who's all powerful and then horrible evil and suffering. So what are the options for how we think about that. So option number one is simply just remove God from the equation, right? The assumption with this view is there's no way to make that equation make sense, so let's just drop the loving God from the equation. And a lot of people do that, and I get it. A lot of people just leave faith or don't even consider faith because they can't make sense of how do you have a loving God and horrible pain and suffering in the world, and so they remove the possibility of God from the equation. So that's, that's an option. Now, there's at least two problems that arise from that. One is you still have all the pain and suffering in the world. You've just removed one person to blame for it. And so then you have all the questions, okay, where does it come from? Do we have any purpose in life? Like what? That's a whole other can of women's, but that's one. The second is there's zero hope in that worldview. And that's not an accusation. That's just calling the facts. And I've watched this play out, and there's kind of two big ways that I see this play out from people who hold this position. There's the number one, the, I call it the get rich or die trying position, right? It's like, you only got one life, there's no God coming to save you, so do everything to make sure that you're on top, make sure you don't get sick, spend your money on safety, health, wellness, etc., because you're on your own. Nobody's coming to help you. And that way of thinking, and you've probably seen this, often ends up hurting others, Right? The second way I see this play out is that it's on us because there is no God, so we got to do our best with the world with what we have. And just to be honest, like I've seen incredible humanitarian work done with people with this worldview. There's incredible things being done in the world, and often Christians don't want to acknowledge that. It's almost like there's this sense of like, wait, we can't say that the people who don't believe in God are doing good things. I'm like, actually, if we believe everyone's creating the image of God, then isn't that evidence that God's still moving in people's hearts, that there is goodness in humanity? So those are some of the different 
different ways I see it playing out, but that's option one. Just remove God from the equation, and then you don't have to square that circle. So that's the first one. Option two is people get what they deserve. So it sounds horrible, but this view is actually really, really popular. It kind of sneaks in, but it's there. People with this view kind of say things like, oh yeah, God is perfectly loving, and there's suffering in the world, and so if people are suffering, they deserve it. They're getting what they deserve. And this view actually gets pushed by many cultures, many faith traditions, including some Christians. I remember when earthquakes hit certain parts of the world. I remember speaking to a Christian pastor from a country that had been incredibly hit incredibly hard. And he said to me, he said, Mark, he's like, God is giving our people what we deserve. And then he went on to outline decisions people in that country had made throughout history and how this was God's payback for the evil that they had done. Before I speak to that, let me, let me just say this, okay? At Lakeside, we have this phrase that we throw around all the time called deep faith, wide embrace. We, we say like, you know, we can agree to disagree. Like we just, we love lots of people even if we disagree and hey, you hold this view and we hold that view, but we're all trying to move towards Jesus and that's really important, right? And I don't feel the need often to like, you know, um, referee between the views. Sometimes I'll just present, hey, some people hold this view. Some people think this is happening in the text. I love that about our church. Not today. <laughs> Today, I will just tell you what I think, okay? This idea that people get what they deserve, my opinion here, but let me just say it, is horrible theology. God is exactly like Jesus because Jesus is God. And there's no time where Jesus injects someone with cancer to teach them a lesson. There's no time that Jesus hurts someone physically because they had it coming. There is no time that Jesus sends a storm to teach someone a lesson. Jesus doesn't give people what they deserve. He gives them grace, hard stop. The idea that pain is God giving people what they deserve is not found in Jesus, period. I'm passionate about this. Why? because I've seen firsthand the kind of pain and trauma that this theology creates. Number one, it's victim blaming. And Jesus doesn't blame victims. He defends and cares for them. Secondly, it's incredibly damaging long-term. I've spoken to so many Christians who grew up with this idea, and years later, this idea is still inflicting damage. Heck, I know Christians who used to believe this, who've now kind of you know, gone through it and said, okay, no, that's not like Jesus. Jesus isn't like that. They don't even believe that anymore. And they're like, but it's so ingrained in them that every time something bad happens to them or their family or their kids, they immediately feel guilt like clearly I did something wrong. It's like in their bones. That's how dangerous this kind of thinking is. When bad things happen to people, they're diagnosed with cancer, they're victim of a crime, they suffer chronic pain, we should never say, I wonder what they did to deserve that. Stop saying it, stop believing it. God doesn't give people what they deserve. We believe in a God who shows grace. Mark, tell us what you really think. Okay. (laughs) Option three, predeterminism. It's exactly as it sounds. This idea is that everything happens in the world is all predetermined, predeterminism, right? God planned it all out and everything that has happened is part of a puzzle and each piece matters, right? You've probably never heard the phrase predeterminism, but you've probably heard phrases like this, right? Uh, that's all part of God's plan or it must be the will of God or I wonder what God is up to or everything happens for a reason. I gotta be honest, I personally held this view for a long time. Someone would die unexpectedly, and I'd be like, well, it's okay. God's in control. God must have a plan. You know, we were speaking about this death, this unexpected death, like there was some sort of cosmic chess match happening, and this was just the next move, and this was a pawn that God needed to sacrifice to get to a better end. But when you think about predeterminism long enough, there are things that get uncomfortable really quickly. If everything's predetermined, that means God gets credit for every move. That includes horrible things that happened. It means that God is the driving force behind all acts of evil, and I'm just not comfortable giving God the credit for human trafficking and child abuse and home invasions and abusive parents. I'm not comfortable attributing children being maimed in a roadside bomb to a God who's at work moving chess pieces to bring about good. Again, I just don't see it in Jesus. Now, people push back and say, but Mark, Mark, you don't understand, like, God's ways are not our ways. <clears throat> God's are, and remember, Uh, not our ways and, you know, who are we to question God? But remember, we are invited to be just like God. And yet if we did those things, we'd be put in prison. But God does them and gets a pass somehow because his ways aren't our ways. I think that's dangerous. 
I mean, play it out. When we truly believe that God is moving chess pieces and everything is predetermined, we are arguing that the ends always can justify the means. And if we're invited to be like God, then that means humans can say the ends justify the means as long as the ultimate goal is good and we can actually do bad things. How does that play out? You don't need to imagine very much. We're seeing this play out right now. How many children have died so far in Israel and Gaza? And you'll hear Christians justifying it because they're pointing to some future goal. They're justifying the means by the end, baptizing violence in God's name. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. I'm actually in a pastor's group chat and we often go back and forth sharing different things and things we're wrestling with. And one of my, my friends, James, was lamenting some of the toxic theology that's on display with some of this. And he texted this in all caps. He says, how do people not realize that killing children is always wrong? I may have edited some choice words out of his phrase. I texted James last night for permission to use this quote, and he said, to be clear, Mark, I think killing anyone is always wrong, but children is an easier sell. Bottom line, he's saying, this should be obvious. This should be so obvious to every Jesus follower that there is never a time where it's okay. But when we grab on to predeterminism, we can miss it, and we can justify the means by the ends. Remember, Robin always tells us that theology matters. When you believe predeterminism, you can excuse horrific things as long as you think the ends justify the means. Because you believe in a God who does horrific things, you can too. I got problems with that. So bottom line, predeterminism, in my opinion, has some issues to say with the way it paints God's character, and I personally am just not comfortable with it, explaining the evil in the world. Fourth option, in case you haven't picked up, this is the one I'm voting for, but again, you're welcome to believe what you want. I'm going to suggest that this is the one that makes the most sense in light of Scripture, and I'll call it the dominion and free will argument. Let me unpack it for you. Uh, You remember a few weeks ago, Robin talked about the creation stories, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, kind of our origin stories of origin and purpose of humanity. And the thing that Robin laid out so brilliantly brilliantly was that God created the world and gave, remember that big word, dominion, to us, right? To put it in Laban's terms, God made humans the managers and stewards of the earth. And our mandate was to tame the world, to help it to flourish and grow and thrive. That has been and always will be our mandate. And so what we take away from the story is God is in control of the cosmos, but God creates us and has entrusted us to care for the earth. Reminds me of uh, last week, I was, uh, it was Easter, and so Trefina actually made it out to church, and our kids were taken care of, so it was just the two of us, and it was nice to get and sit with my wife, it's rare, you know the story, but um, anyways, by the time we finished chatting with everyone, we kind of looked around, and we're like, oh, everyone's gone, like, we're the last ones here, and amongst the staff, there's kind of this, like, I don't want to be the last one out, because then you got to do the walk around. Walk around is like, you know, 60,000 square feet of, like, doors and checks and light switches, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and uh, then you set the alarm and head out, and so, like, I just got to do the walk around, she's like, I'll come with you. I'm like, we're without kids. It'll be like a little date. <laughs> so romantic, right? And so we're literally like holding hands, checking doors, turning off lights, going through the whole building. And we're, we're like backstage in like the mechanical room. And there's these massive HVAC units that honestly, I don't even know what they do. <laughs> They're just like the size of a truck. And there's a diesel engine back there that powers on in the case of an emergency and sends this water to the sprinklers and just incredible things. And so at one point, Trevi is laughing. She's like, So uh, 60,000 square feet and like dozens of furnaces and all this stuff. And she's like, and you're the lead pastor. She's like, like, this is all under you. And yet you can't even order at the drive-thru with kids in the backseat without having an anxiety attack. Like, how does that work? (laughs) Right? Like, you forgot to put the recycling out last week. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's this thing about empowering others, babe. Right? (laughs) Given authority. I've given dominion to my staff. Someone wants to rent this place? They don't call me. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. They call Pauline. She's amazing. The internet goes down. Nobody ever calls me. They call Ben. A bill needs to be paid. They call Kevin. The authority has been handed over and entrusted to different people. They have dominion over the areas of responsibility. Likewise, the story in the opening pages of scripture is that the earth is created and sustained by the creator, but the earth is entrusted to humans. The analogy does break down. I'm not likening myself to God, just to be clear, okay? But that's what I mean by dominion, and that dominion was handed over to humans. 
And as we continue to read, we also learn that humans are given free will. We covered that in the message on Cain and Abel, and God tells us we have a choice to choose. Do we choose the way of love or the way of self-preservation? Self-giving love or self-taking, right? And every day, we have the free will. You see that on display in your homes with family and friends. We have the choice to make a choice to love others and care for others or to self-serve And that's the choice that we have because we have free will. So bottom line, from the first pages of scripture, we learn humans have dominion and free will. And that's important because the equation that we always put up is perfectly loving, all-powerful God, horrible, evil, suffering. And I understand because the humans are asking the question and we don't want to indict ourselves. But it's interesting to me that we never ask, and how do we fit into all this? Where do we fit in? That never gets asked, but what I'd love to do for the remainder of our time is to look at the three different types of suffering that we see in our world and ask, how do we square that circle, not forgetting that we're part of the equation too, because we have some responsibility as people with free will and dominion. So let's start with evil, with human evil. Now this one is, and I'll say this in air quotes, easiest. It's it's not easy by any means, but it's easier the other two. And why? Because at the center of evil, there's always people. Sexual assault, robbery, abuse, gang violence, organized crime, human trafficking. Humans are always at the center. Humans who are exercising free will and dominion. Humans who are choosing to exercise their freedom in the opposite way that God has invited them to. Which most people actually agree with. And then when you zoom out, though, to the extremes, that's where I got the questions too, right? It's like some of the worst situations that the world has ever seen. You know, the Holocaust always gets used as an example. You could say, okay, I get free will. I get that, you know, so much of the evil we see in the world is on us. But like, God, seriously, you couldn't take that one guy out and avoided all of that? How could you let him live? Like, seriously, God? And I get that. But then let's also remember the Holocaust is not just the story of one man. Read the history. It's millions of people making decision after decision in a certain direction for over a decade and it leading to a horrible, horrible place. There's so many ways to slice it, but again, humans with free will and dominion and how they chose to use their free will. And the thing we see in Jesus, or one of the things we see in Jesus, is that God doesn't mess with our free will. Jesus doesn't force anyone to change their minds. Does he invite them to? Absolutely, but he will never force himself, force them to change their minds. Jesus does give us his spirit and his teachings to guide us, but what we do with that is on us because we're free. But that brings up another point, and here's how I would say it. Say, listen, we can't blame God for how we use our free will. But, there's a skeptic in me, we can question God for giving us free will. Right? So let's pull on that string for a second. Some of you are thinking, as I think, God should have foreseen the fact that we would cause harm with our free will and maybe never should have given us free will to begin with because we could get hurt. And that's a fair question. There's some mystery there. It's a question I have for Jesus when I meet him face to face, right? Why give us free will in the first place, knowing the mess we would make of the world? But then at the same time, when I really reflect, because sometimes you just got to sit with these questions, I'm also aware that I regularly use my free will to choose to take part in things that have risk and danger. I regularly take part in things that have the potential to go sideways. I, just a small example, years ago, a friend of mine had a neighbor who was wrestling with their kids and in a freak accident, just fell off the bed and just happened to land in the wrong way and they're paralyzed for life. I'm aware of that risk. I mean, freak accident, but every time, I still, every night, get on the bed, wrestle with my kids. It gets wild. (laughs) But we do that, don't we, as humans? Like, there's things we know, like, there's some risk here, but I'm willing to risk it. So we as humans, you know, we're like, oh God, you should never have risked it. Should have never given us free will. I'm like, yeah, but it's interesting that when we have that choice, we do choose some risk too, don't we? It's interesting. And then my wild imagination, because I have a wild imagination, right? I start to wonder, what would a world where free will was limited or even eliminated look like to make sure that nobody got hurt, that nobody could make a decision to harm someone else? And this is the image that came to mind in my head. Have you ever played bubble soccer? <laughs> Imagine, it's like, do you want to live that way? I mean, sure, we'd be a lot safer, but gosh, I mean, now that I'm doing youth ministry, I mean, that would help with hormones, right? Like, but like, seriously, (laughs) stick to the script, Mark. Hey, but hey, but like, if you honestly think about it, you're like, oh, yeah, it's true, right? Like we don't actually desire risk-free living. In fact, 
we are really passionate about freedom. We talk about fighting for freedom, right? Like, and that's a whole other thing, right? But like, freedom's something that if we pass the microphone around, depending on your definition, most of us would be like, yeah, I think freedom's a good thing. I would like more freedom, not less. It's easy to say, I wish I never had free will, but most people I chat with don't desire less free will. And the last point on this one before we move on, not to downplay the incredible evil that is in the world. Trust me, I'm aware. But often I think we, we need to balance it out. The world, you know, often the message is that the world is getting worse and worse. In fact, the, the stats tell us that study after study around the world is that people's perception is that the world is getting more and more dangerous and evil year after year after year. It's been a growing perception for decades. But the truth is, statistically, the world is getting safer on almost every measurable way, not more dangerous. Every measure of poverty, education, war, murder, access to food and water. Globally, statistically, the world is actually better year over year. But remember the popular adage, if it bleeds, it leads? Nobody is making headlines because they use their free will to care for others. Nobody is making headlines for sacrificing for others, but statistically, the world is in better shape than it's ever been. Here's the bottom line of why I'm telling you that. It's easy to get caught up in all the evil that comes out of our free will, but we often forget the beauty and the ingenuity that comes out of our free will as well. So there's some things to think about. Okay, let's move on because we've got lots to cover still. Um, there's still some questions on free will, specifically, hey God, why give it to us? But maybe that helps you kind of wrestle with that a little bit. Uh, number two, natural disasters. How do you explain those? Storms, floods, earthquakes, volcanoes. How do we explain a loving God who controls everything and is all powerful and an earth that kills countless people in natural disasters? Well, in the ancient world, you know, thousands of years ago, everything that happened was just attributed to the gods. You know, there's a big storm, Poseidon's angry and stirring the ocean. You have talked about this before, right? Just everything was blamed. The volcano's erupting, God's angry. The lightning struck that person, Zeus struck them down, right? That was the thinking. Now we understand more, right? Most of these things I've just spoken of, we realize that's just kind of how the world works. When we have a snowstorm, nobody says, do you think God's angry about such and such? No, we say we live in Canada and it's December, right? Like we just understand these things happen. When a lightning bolt strikes, we don't say Zeus is doling out punishment. We realize positive and negative charges built up between the earth and the clouds exploded in energy. Earthquakes, floods, volcanoes. We now understand these things are part of the earth's cycle of sustaining itself. You look at the core of the earth and the magma heats and cools and that, that sustains things. And the, the way that the plates move and shift and then finally when the plates, the pressure builds and they have to move, if it's under the ocean, we get a tsunami. If it's on earth, we get an earthquake. You get the point, volcanoes, everything, right? Storms and hurricanes happen. We realize when the pressure in the atmosphere is regulating, it's the way the planet deals with hot and cold. So there's a part to say these activities are what happen on a planet for homeostasis or it's a self-regulating process for the world. In the same way that our bodies sweat to cool us down, the earth has a way of self-regulating. This is how the planet sustains life. Now with that said, remember the skeptic in me, I'm like, that doesn't take God off the hook though, right? If God is all powerful and all knowing, God should have known when God created the world that these things would happen. So my question for God is, hey, when you were creating the world, why not create a world that doesn't need regulation of hot and cold? And why not create a world without atmospheric pressure and get rid of the earth's crust while you're at it? And I think it's a good question because there's some mystery there for me. But till that day, and God and I get to chat face to face and God can explain it all, I, I have my imagination that starts to maybe try and answer some of those questions. And I wonder to myself, what would the world look like that didn't require self-regulating a world without the gifts of hot and cold be like, without snow to play in, without beaches to rest on, without saunas to sweat in and cold water to cool off in, or ice to keep our drinks cold. What would it look like a world without ancient, beautiful mountains to climb and just stand in awe in? What would it look like without raging rivers to paddle down or jump in or waves to swim in and feel the current against your body? Again, it's kind of like living in a bubble. Would we want to live on a planet that's so vanilla it had nothing to delight in and yet also nothing to hurt us? I kind of picture that room from the Matrix. Remember that? Like that white room, just pure white. I don't really want to live there. But anyways, that's, that's a question and that I, I have. I just kind of wonder about that. But even though I don't have the answer to that, I, 
I did say I was going to poke a little. So before we move on to the last one, let's stick with natural disasters for a second. Let's pause and hold the mirror up to ourselves. Natural disasters are often predictable. The season and the location of many of these events is often not a mystery. That region's prone to flooding. That region is prone to earthquakes. You get the point. And we actually know how to engineer homes that are much safer. We know how to build dikes and flood control and how to engineer homes that can withstand earthquakes. And yet the people who are disproportionately affected by natural disasters are the poor. The poor disproportionately live in flood zones, disproportionately live in mud buildings or concrete homes without rebar. So again, holding the mirror up to ourselves, if we have dominion over the world and we have free will and humans have chosen to hoard wealth instead of share, is pointing our finger at God, the God who showed us that living fully alive is serving and sacrificing for your neighbor? Is pointing our finger at God really the best move? The indictment does go both ways. A parallel example is food. How many people die a year from lack of food and yet study after study shows us there's more than enough food on the planet to feed everyone? Do we blame God or is the indictment on those with dominion? God doesn't force us to share. God teaches us to, but doesn't force us. God doesn't violate our free will. Okay, like I said, scraping the surface won't even touch human influence, natural disasters. That's a whole other can of worms. But let's go number three, sickness and suffering. We'll end on this one. Now, we just lived through a pandemic that killed countless, shut in so many, and we're still dealing with the physical and mental health challenges that have followed that. We also see cancer, AIDS, cardiac challenges, physical challenges, chronic pain, short lifespans, mental health. Many in our church right now are experiencing or watching loved ones experience great sickness, pain, and suffering. It's horrible. And when you're in the thick of it, all you can think is, seriously, God, do something. Please do something. And I get that. And we'll unpack that a bit more next week when we talk about why does it seem like God doesn't answer our prayers? Because I get that one. So we'll unpack this a bit more there, but let's, let's at least scrape it a little bit today. Um, there's a lot of mystery on this one here for me. I have more questions than answers, right? I think, God, you created the world. Couldn't you have seen these things, you know, but, and couldn't you have written these things out of it? So I get that. But then, to be fair, I have to look at health and be amazed at some of the incredible things that God has built into our world. A quick example, many of you have been asking about Trifina's eye. Um, for those of you who don't know, a few weeks ago, my wife uh, took a Nerf bullet to the eyeball. Uh, to be clear, I didn't shoot it. Another one of my children who will remain nameless, uh, but her eyelid happened to be open at the time. And let's just say um, her eye was incredibly, incredibly damaged. She ended up in Emerge, multiple visits to specialists in downtown Toronto over the last few weeks. And just this week, she had another appointment and the news was good. Uh, It's looking like she's going to make a full recovery. And that part, yes, yes. Um, And the part that blew my mind was when the doctor said, you know, Eyes just kind of heal themselves. And I was like, wow. Thousands of years of human engineering, and we can't even create a car that doesn't rust after three years, right? Like, as much as I will sing the praises of Toyota engineering, my Toyota can't even heal itself, right? Sure, it might last 20 years, but our bodies get a scratch at 80 years old, and they heal themselves, They have the ability to adapt to viruses and strengthen themselves. In fact, we now know viruses actually strengthen our DNA. So when I'm tempted to complain about the body, I also try and remember the incredible uniqueness of our bodies, like nothing else in the world. And then I think about creation and all the incredible nutrients and medicines that we're able to find to alleviate pain and aid in healing. And when I look at Jesus' life, I'm struck by the fact that when Jesus walked the earth and he encountered sickness, he used every bit of his power, everything that was available to him to care for the sick and the hurting. He was showing and modeling for us how to live. And that means that he's inviting us to be just like him. So every time I see a doctor or a nurse or a PSW or an epidemiologist or a surgeon doing their work, I'm reminded of Jesus, that that is the work of God, that that is the business that Jesus is in. Every time someone drives someone to a doctor's appointment, makes a meal for someone suffering, that is the work of Jesus. 
So when I'm tempted to say, where was God? I'm also cautious to not look past the hands and feet of Jesus in, that's, that are currently caring for those people in need. In fact, we know this, don't we? Like when we receive good care in times of desperate need, we often use supernatural terms to refer to the person who cared for us. We say that that doctor was an angel. That nurse was like a miracle worker. That person was a godsend. They showed up at my door at just the right time. There's something in us that seems to know that good care is to experience the hands and feet of Jesus in the community around us. Those who are actually given care for the earth and all who are in it. So listen, I'm, I'm not at all downplaying the horrible suffering that people go through. I, I know how much suffering you go through, friends. But I also want to acknowledge the way we who are entrusted with this world and have dominion over it have opportunities every day to care for, comfort, and walk alongside those suffering. And that God gives us these incredible bodies that can heal themselves and gives us incredible talents to care for each other. And lastly, I'm reminded that when Jesus encountered death, he wept. So as much as I still have many questions about sickness and disease and an all-powerful God, I'm also comforted by a God who is not ignoring sickness and death, but is actually weeping over it and inviting us to be a part of caring for the sick and hurting. So when I wrestle with the sickness of the world, I spend my time trying to nail down the why, 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 but I also don't want to miss the fact that Jesus is empowering, inviting us to be his hands and feet in the world caring for the sick, the hurting, the marginalized, the victimized, and so on. So why don't we pause our conversation here for today? Like I said, no neat little bows, but hopefully some thoughts to wrestle with. But before we close, I wonder if we can be still for a little bit, as we often do here. It'd be a real tragedy to spend all our time talking about suffering in the world and to not take time personally to see how God might be inviting us to look and partner with him and caring for it. So I'm going to invite Nathan up and just create some space for us to reflect over the last few minutes. And we're going to ask God how we might respond to the pain and hurting in our world today. If you just want to be still and allow God to speak to you, or maybe you want to sit with a few questions that I've written to just kind of uh, prompt you to listening to the Holy Spirit's voice. Here, I'll just walk them through quickly. One, is there something evil in our realm or even in our life that we need to address? Two, is there a disaster on our radar that God is prompting us to give our attention to? And three, what would being the hands and feet of Jesus to someone sick or suffering look like this week? Why don't we just take a couple minutes and just be still and see how the Holy Spirit might speak to each and every one of us. Before you head out, I just want to remind you our prayer teams will be up at the crosses and they'd be so happy to pray with you. 
uh, for anything. As you go, I just want to encourage you, the passage from James came to mind. And he's basically speaking to people who often see suffering. He's like, what good is it if you just wish them well or pray for them? He's like, you need to actually go and do this good. To not just, you know, he's saying to speak the name of Jesus, but we actually get to be Jesus. That's what we're invited to leverage our free will and dominion for. So friends, may we be Jesus to the people we encounter this week. Have a great week. Thank <laughs> you.